Um, yeah, Kasi, thank you so much. It's uh, just wonderful to be here today. I, um, my brother actually introduced me to this opportunity, and then Kasi gave me a call, uh, did a few cross checks, and uh, here we are. So it's wonderful to be here today, and I'm sure you're going to learn something. Uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards, and also I'll be on Friday, and most welcome to just touch, touch base with me. So um, the theme of this session is your amazing neurological design. So I'm so grateful that we had Etienne and who is the other doctor that we really, yeah, this today, because they are so intellectual, you know what I'm saying? They used all the words that we didn't understand, you know, and we sat there, nodded our heads, and made people understand that in the meantime, we lost. <laughs> right. so, so this session is really, uh, um, we're taking neuroscience and making it simple. Uh, really simple. It's not neuroscience for dummies, because we're the dumb, but really just make it simple and try to put um, this information and make it practical. Right, so I'm sure you're going to enjoy this. But just a uh, short um, uh, uh, introduction. Now it's always important to connect with your audience from a speaker's perspective, you know that. All right, so uh, I'm going to tell you a story, it's got nothing to do with this presentation, but I'm going to connect with you, is that good with you? All right, so, so it's a long story, but I'm going to cut the long story short because we don't have a lot of time. But uh, my, my dad came from a very poor background, my mom from a very wealthy background. So eventually they met at school, but it was problematic because he was poor and she was rich. She went on to study medicine uh, in Pretoria, and my dad didn't have money to go and study. So he would work to gather ma money and then st study one year, work one year. And uh, in my mom's second year of studies, uh, she called him. She said, there's this guy that likes me. I'm not sure what to do about it. She said, well, this is nonsense. I'm going to fetch you. So he drove from Durban at the coast to the city in Pretoria, and he just took my mom. She never completed his studies. So can you imagine? That wasn't good for her parents. And, uh, but lo and behold, uh, love prevailed. Um, they got married. Uh, her parents didn't come to the wedding because they were too uh, angry about this thing. And my dad's parents were too poor to travel to come to the wedding. You know? But you know how it is with love. You know, along come the children. So there was one child, and then the second one comes, and then the third one comes, and my dad is still working and studying, working and studying. My mom said, okay, let's just end our family with a little fourth baby, and she fell pregnant with the triplets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, listen, there's money to be made here today. If you can guess which one I am, you can maybe win yourself a few. Back. Top one, that one. You are right. Okay, <laughs> so that's me. But we had fun growing up, you know, because my mom always used to dress us the same. Okay, so people got confused. And uh, we would go on holiday, and this was this, this round little houses, and our triplets, we were chasing one another around these houses. And there was one guy standing, he told my dad, he said, Sir, you've got the fastest boy I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Just in this day. <laughs> And uh, even till today we have fun, um, uh, w that's Walter, that's me, that's Usher. Um, Walter is a medical doctor and uh, he, his patients is from all over the country. So I walk into a mall, here comes a guy and doctor, 90% better, 90% better. I'm so glad the treatment is working, come back for more, you know. So it's confusing all the way, but fun as, as well. So, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just phenomenal to see how God guides you towards your life's destiny. And uh, it's just phenomenal. Just, I, I believe each of you have your own story to tell uh, about the faithfulness of God. So I'm really thankful that I can be here today. So obviously it's a, it's a neuroscience day. So I have to say something about the brain, don't I? Right? So there's been a, a, a Japanese psychologist, and he's actually done very good studies about the brain many years ago. And I want you to look at those four brains, but don't overthink. Look at those four brains and quickly pick one that you feel, you know, that's you. Could be the color, whatever. Make your choice. Okay. Remember that six seconds thing, right? So who of you chose the first one? Okay, a few. If you did, intelligent, strong decision makers, analytical thinkers, well done, right? Who of you chose the second one? Okay, if you did, that's your creative, strong imagination, innovative thinker, fantastic. Who have you chose that third one? 
a few hands there. Um, lateral thinkers, prepared to look at all sides. All brain thinkers, well done, Cassie. Who have you chose the last one? Just the last one. <laughs> 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 okay. I have to say this is <laughs> this is not true. Okay, please, this is not true. Okay, it's just a joke. All right, but but seeing that we are on the brain topic, I just want to clarify one or two things about the male and the female brain because there's always confusion in terms of this. So if I present you with this brain, mine is because you have a brain as well. That uh, yeah, yeah, mine is. In your car car. <laughs> so if you, if you look at this brain, would you be able to say whether it's a male or female brain? I think yes. Because male brain, you know, larger, more brain cells, more intellect, you know what I'm saying? Okay. It's a joke. Not true. Okay. <laughs> right. But however, there are a few distinct differences between the uh, male and the female brain. Okay. And the one is that the male brain, in terms of communica communication, uh, it's more back front communication. Back front. With female, it's more crisscross. And one of the reasons is where the two hemispheres connect at the corpus callosum. Uh, the female's connection, uh, for lack of a better word, it's thicker than that of men. So that's why well, you, you also find that females are sometimes better at multitasking than men. We know it's now good, but you know what I'm saying? But you'll find a woman, she'll have the baby in the arm, the hand in the pot, the one ear on the phone, and one eye on the television. You know what I'm saying? And they're capable of knowing everything all the time. So, uh, but, but interesting just in terms of structure, also of, 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 of the length of certain parts in the ear, whereas, uh, well, let's say a woman would um, scream, uh, and for her it's very serious, but for a man it's amusing. And it's simply because of the different design. Um, and it's all happening in, in our brain. But I'll touch on uh, those funnies a little bit later again. Okay, so, um, The fundamental, there's a door that's yeah. going squeak squeak yeah. the whole time. Um, so our fundamental point of departure for this session is neuroscience, okay? And why the brain? You know, if I stress and you stress, what happens in our brain? Chemicals are released, isn't it? Okay, the very same chemicals, cortisol, adrenaline, morphine, whatever it is, okay? When you feel, feel good, the same chemicals, right? You wouldn't be able to say whether it's a Christian brain, a Muslim brain, or atheist brain. So it, it, it serves as a very solid point of departure for any intervention. Um, th they've done studies all over the world with 200,000 people in 52 different countries. And all the, the tests came out exactly the same for all nations. All colors. So there's no difference in brain functioning, which makes it a very safe point of departure uh, uh, to, to intervene. Um, but neuroscience also touch on identity. Who of you have heard about Brene Brown's work? So Brene Brown, you know, she said something like, they've, um, she's a psychologist and she um, had issues. And a friend tell her, you need a psychologist, right? So the psychologist needs a psychologist. She went and she said it, it, it put her on a, on, on a journey to discuss to study why, what makes people successful and what not. And she studied 5,000 women, and she said if she had to coin it to one single, single determiner was a sense of worthiness. And that touched at the core of identity, isn't it? So, so when, whenever we do development work with people, I always start with identity. Because you can, you can treat all this stuff superficial, but if identity is not sorted out, you can have mixed results or just pockets of excellence here and there. You know what I'm saying? So that, that holistic point of departure is so important, but using the brain as a point of departure. So uh, then uh, it, um, Etienne this morning mentioned the heart. So if let's say I'm in a relationship and the girl says goodbye to me. What do I say? I am I'm heartbroken. So shouldn't I say I'm brain broken? Doesn't the brain, you know what I'm saying? So is it just a metaphor or is there something in that? So there's been incredible studies done by, um, it's called heart cell memory. 
which says that the same uh, neurons responsible for memory in the brain is found in the heart as well. Okay, so so for instance, um, uh, it, it's a very a bad, a gruesome example, but what happened, there was a, a, a nine-year-old girl, and she was um, raped and strangled to death. And her heart was given to an 11-year-old girl, right? And during the process of recovery, this 11-year-old girl started to get these recurring dreams of this rape and murder scene. Uh, she could exactly say how the person looked like, what he smelled like, the clothes that he wore, everything. And they matched her description to a previous sex offender because there was DNA left in the scene, and it was a match. They, they, they got him. You know? There was another girl, um, she was a ballerina, right? and uh, she got the, the heart of a man. Now, she never drank anything, like an alcohol, you know. And she said, but suddenly in the afternoons, around about five o'clock, she wanted to go to the bar to just to get something to drink, you know. And she even got some manly mannerisms, all right? So there is something to say about the heart. The heart has a memory. And if you're interested, I'll forward the, the study to you, Kasi. You can just distribute that to, to the others, right? So uh, uh, someone, there was also mentioned about the gut earlier this, this day. So this is, it's called the three brains. The brain, the heart, and the gut. So wonderful stuff about that that you can go and, go and read about. Um, and also... Neuroscience help us to, 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 to focus on a strength-based approach. Develop what you're good at. I mean, manage the rest, but develop what you're good at. And the simple reason for this is they've done a very interesting study with children that battle to read. And they've put these children, I think they could read something like 60 words per minute. And they put them through a, a course where they, they, they learn to read, and after a certain amount of time, they could read 100 words per minute. Fantastic, would people say. But then they took children that could read well, about 120 to 150 words per minute, the same period of time, and after the same training, they could read 650 words. So, so the point uh, that we make is focus on that, but you, uh, your strengths, and strengthen that. And maybe learn to manage the rest or get a similar team around you. To, to help you with the rest. Does that make sense to you? Okay, otherwise you, you always feel incompetent, incompetent. If you focus on what you cannot do the whole time. Right, um, th so, so it, it combines a number of known interventions like uh, that I've been shared this morning. Even this morning our second speaker referred to the intelligence um, types, you know. Um, so so it's, it's studies from, from all over that we just tap into. Um, um, Peter Drucker said, knowing your strengths and how you learn and think and acting on this knowledge is the key to performance, right? So it's a very simple question, but do you, do you really know your strengths? Have you ever embarked on a journey to see what your strengths are? You know, I'm, I'm currently uh, I'm busy working with a company, and I've asked the company, who of you, uh, the Exco, top leadership, who of you the past 10 years attended any course of any sort that develops you and makes you, that you know who you are? One lady put up her hand, she's been on a marriage uh, course and luckily she's still married, okay, wonderful. But the rest not. I asked how many of you read any, any book on this stuff? Not a single person. So people don't invest in themselves, right? So that's why the role that we play is so crucial. That's why, the, why you should continue equipping yourself as much as you can with information. But I just I want to clearly say it, it's not only about information. It's about putting that information into practice. You know, the, the sad thing about a conference like this is people will walk away all enthusiastic and inspired. But inspiration is not transformation. Do you know what I'm saying? So people will sit in church and say, oh, that's true, that's true. They even cry a little bit. But they go home and they still treat their wife bad. you know what I'm saying? So, so obviously God has done his part, but we do have a part to play. All right, and he's giving us the tools in this day and age. So, so ask yourself that question, how about you? And, and you know what? It's a continuous journey. I really thought I was the perfect man until I got married. You know what I'm saying? So, so somehow God is starting all over again <laughs> with me. So, um, so, so in terms of, uh, of this session, we will look at your current reality in terms of brain functioning and then your design. So if I say your current reality, we're asking the question, what are the things that impact your brain performance? 
and then in the same line your effectivity right so um, so this is just a, a dashboard to give you all of them uh, at a glance uh, the first one is brain fitness I'll say something about that right now stress sleep movement attitude and food so we've touched on food a little bit and sleep uh, I'll just say something about stress again um, and a little bit of about movement but what is brain fitness anybody got an idea what brain fitness is or brain integration so we are born with two hemispheres all right so and we are born homo lateral what does homo means homo means one all right -o? so we learn to integrate these two hemispheres it doesn't happen automatically all right -o? so remember uh, our previous speaker said that the brain's wiring works cross over right -o? so if i wave with this hand what's happening this side lights up okay and with both hands both light up so what's the analogy the analogy is if we use both hemispheres simultaneously it's like flying to your back to your country what happens if the one engine seizes the plane will still get there but you put stress on the on one engine right and it takes longer same with the brain if you fire too much on the one engine you're going to put neurological stress on this brain okay so we want this now obviously we've got a whole brain so it's not two separate parts they are connected all right but sometimes there's more focus on the one or the other right um, but you understand as we go along so I just want to give you a feeling of how it feels to use your whole brain all right so I'm gonna count to three and you do that one two three go <laughs> right so all of you just do this all right oh? do this with your hands so both hands both hemispheres you happy with that okay and do this not difficult this easy hey so keep the one like that and the other one like this now and now change that around <laughs> okay suddenly it's not that easy okay so we, we start with the easy one so let's go higher grade so just do this for me all right do this for me so with the one hand you pull in the one finger so that the thumb is up and the other hand you're letting the thumb fall that the finger is pointing now change that around that you've got one finger pointing and one thumb up not more than one finger either pointing or up <laughs> all right so 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 we, we battling to do this because it's, it's a novelty why do i don't but I, i've practiced right so are you ready for one last exercise okay you may just take this back home i, I you know i thought the panel was going to be here because they would know i know how to do this but sadly not all right so do this just tap the hands and then put your one hand to your nose and the other one cross over to your ear okay tap again put the other hand to the nose and then cross over to your ear okay so try if you can see do a few of them in a row like this <laughs> okay I, I see this and confusion you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so there was one guy he did this I said change direction he says I am changing direction <laughs> okay but that's the thing so we learn to do that so if you want to integrate good stuff to learn to play instrument uh, flute you should have spoken about flute earlier okay both hands both hemispheres right chess it's phenomenal back left back right front okay so, it's, it's, so there's a lot of things that you can do to improve that connectivity between your two hemispheres and i'll explain to you later on why it's necessary especially during stress right um so um let me just run through them quickly so brain fitness we discussed um stress um, if you drive and suddenly you have to slam the brake, what happens? You feel pins and needles, uh, heart beats faster. The other day I ran and, uh, with, and a dog came out and chased me. So what happened? I don't have a lot, but it felt as if my head stood upright. You know what I'm saying? Okay. You just, what did you feel? You felt chemicals, right? It's the stress chemicals that's there to protect you over a short period of time but the problem is a lot of us we run on those fields continuously right so just two days ago I did a profile feedback for one person and he was right in the red so I asked him is it circumstantial what and he just came out so this is the story right so I say it's good for now but you cannot run on that field because we heard in more intelligent words it makes you sick and various uh, uh, effects thereof but what's the point okay so that's one brain cell trying to connect to another brain cell 
So if you stressed, those messages are either blocked or slowed down. I mean, just on a practical way, if you were stressed, really stressed, have you made your best decisions under stress? Who have you made some of your worst decisions under stress? Because of that. All right, uh, so it's simple. So uh, let's just go back to the classroom. A child writes a test and he's stressed. Who have you ever wrote a test and said, I, I struck a blank? You, you knew it before, but when the test came, you couldn't remember. Is it only me? Okay, so what's the reason for that? Because you did know your work, so why couldn't you recall in the exam? So what did that stress chemical do to you? It makes sense to you? Okay. So in the very same way, we've got your feel-good chemicals, like we've heard, all the fancy names this morning. They are neurotransmitters. They transmit the messages. So when you're calm and relaxed, okay, and the, with the right amount of stress, you can function optimally. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Then sleeping. There's, I think etching described it very well, right? But the bottom line is you need to get a certain amount for your brain to file again and to get rid of the toxins and then to uh, secrete the feel-good chemicals that's important for function, all right? So remember that one. Then movement. Why is movement so important? So I see that gentleman, he's tapping with his, his foot. Sit still, please, okay? <laughs> okay? Why is he doing this with his foot? We earlier heard about the kinesthetic learners, okay? So what am I saying? Movement is his law door to learning, okay? It kickstarts the brain reticulation activation system, right? It also movement gets the cerebral spiral and fluid moving, which, which help with focus and concentration. So move, and you'll see later on some children, they are movement learners, they are kinesthetic, right? For whatever reason that uh, the previous speaker mentioned or just the design of the, of the person, right? Um, then the next one is um, uh, just one thing about movement as well. Why is movement and exercise so, so important? I think Etienne mentioned it. If you exercise, especially that interval training, it's that th th there's no pull that can do for your brain what a good 30, 40 minute exercise can do for you. Releasing all the feel good chemicals, get rid of the toxins, right? So that's why even walking, I would encourage people as a short walk is better than no walk. So um, there's one company in South Africa, they encourage the people to walk and to move. So they would say they have to do 6,000 steps per day, whatever. So the one guy found out that if he, he takes his little wristwatch, put it in a plastic bag, you know the swimming pools, they've got a creepy crawly, like tuck, 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 tuck. If he ties it to the creepy crawly, he gets his 6,000 steps, you know. <laughs> but they caught him out somehow, they found out he, he was a crook. Um, so, the next one, and to me, this is most probably one of the, if not the most important one, is mindset. What is a mindset? If you have to explain it in your words, what's a mindset? Go again. Okay, is it attitude? But it's like I've got a good attitude or a bad attitude. That's what you're saying, okay? But a mindset is your habitual way of thinking under any given circumstance. Right, so, so if a person is born, you know, when I was born, my mom didn't say, Marinius, you're going to be mommy's little racist. Okay? So how do you become a racist? Were well, you born that way? Now, something happened that caused you to become it. So I was, I was growing up at home, and someone said something about people of other, other color. They were planting a seed. Now, you know, the, the brain is just doing its job. It's like soil. If you're going to plant a tomato seed in the soil, what will come up? A tomato plant. But going to plant some wheat there, wheat will come up. So if a seed of racism is planted in this brain and you start to feed it, what's happening? The neurons are connecting and a thinking pattern is forming. It's a protein deposit that is fixed thing in your brain. It's not an imaginary thing or a metaphor. It's, it's a real pathway that causes me to think along certain lines. Whenever ever I see a woman, I think women are inferior. It could be cultural. Can you see, it could be linked to so many things that uh, the, the, the way we live. So, so the, the question is, what mindset governs your thinking patterns? Is it one of possibility or one of negativity? Is it one of I'm, um, I'm better than you? Or maybe it's inferiority. If you have a weak self Complex. Were you born with a weak self-complex? No, you worked at it. 
consciously or sub subconsciously. You know what I'm saying? But you work that feeling inferior. You understand what I'm saying? So how do you, how do you break loose of that mold? It's, it's like if you walk over a patch of grass, nothing. But walk over that patch of grass 10,000 times, it's a clear pathway. Same with your brain. Okay? So what happens, the dendrites connect, a pathway is formed, it, it, it's reinforced if you go around that block the whole time until it becomes permanent and that becomes your automatic response. So I see a person of color, I think, well, that guy is. Or you see a, 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 a Muslim, you think, oh, you know what I'm saying? So one of the things that I realized one day, I was sitting in a, a, a meeting and, you know, in South Africa, we've got a well-known Indian family called the Guptas. And they've been, they've done some crooked business in our country. So whenever you see an Indian guy, you know you cannot trust an Indian doing business with that person. So I was at a conference and the, one of the speakers was an Indian guy. And he spoke about finances. I thought, what? You speak about finances? And the moment when it happened, I realized that my thinking pattern stood in a way of me receiving from that person. So, so I would tell a person, let's say you're a racist and you're a sexist and you're a feminist and also a pessimist as well. And there's a non-white woman and you walk past and she holds the key to your breakthrough. She has it in her hands. And you walk past and say, that's not for me. You've missed an opportunity with destiny. You hear what I'm saying? So I'm asking you, what are the mindset that governs your thinking? My sister, she's been sexually assaulted as a student and after that, she had this uh, diet sickness where you put your finger in your throat. You know what I'm saying? And a, a few years ago, she told me, Marina, she said, for 25 years now that I haven't put my finger in my throat, but I still battle with thinking patterns. So I, I walk around looking free, but I'm held captive by my mindset, the better way of thinking. So, so I, you know, that's something to really challenge. And just look at this, you know, here's a shocking um, truth. 6% um, <laughs> of what I see, I see with my physical eye. But 95% of what I see, it's my inner reality. So let's say uh, Jenny um, looks more like my first grade teacher. She also had short blonde hair, but she was a really bad person. You know, she screamed and shouted at us, okay? And I come here and I see Jenny. I see a woman, but with my mind's eye, I see that teacher. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So can you see that not only do we see with our eyes, we see with our mind's eye, we see with our filters, we see with, see with our cultural filters as well. So it's so important to, underst to, to really understand what is the truth and not my truth. Because there is a universal godly truth in terms of all of this. So remember, actions follow your thought. So what you think you will do. Imitative learning, the most powerful form of learning. Does this make sense to you? So, so if, we, if we talk about how do I control my mind, there's a lot of trick, uh, tips and tricks. But just one, one, one example, for, for instance. How many decisions do you make per day? Any idea? Conscious decisions now. Hey? B uh, between three and six thousand. I mean, this morning you decided with what side of foot you're going to get out of the bed. <laughs> okay. But you decided what socks, what shoes, what clothes. Okay, will I brush my teeth before breakfast, after breakfast? All right. Shall I greet this person? Shall I not? Shall I pray or not? You know, shall I, shall I jog or not? How far will I jog? Shall I turn late? What route will I choose? You know what I'm saying? Decision, decision. So there's thousands of stimulus per day, and you're going to respond to that stimulus. All right. So let's say, um, what is your name? Mike. Mike. I come to Mike, and I spit Mike in his face. Do I make him angry? No, I'm only making him wet, okay? Beca because that was a stimulus, and he's going to respond on that, you know? But, you know, as crazy as it seems, between the stimulus and that response is always, always, always your freedom to choose. If I bump you, bump you, bump you, I can influence you, but I can still not tell you what to think. You know what I'm saying? So um, once, 
you know, the thing that my mom ingrained in us as children, she would always, always tell us children, if there's people you don't know, go and give of yourself. You know, go and talk to them. So it was ingrained in us, that neuron pathway, give yourself. So I was at this church and there was a, a guy, he was a, you know, a punk. He had this real funny hairstyle. And, he man and they, him and his wife were sitting there very lonely. I thought my mom's words, go and give yourself near on pathway. So I went to give myself. But I had a cup of tea in my hand. And as I started to, to speak to them, uh, I took a sip and then I coughed. Now everything was happening in slow motion because the tea went and landed on his perfect, Hair, you know, and then the tea drip slow motion from his hair on his cheek. Everything was slow, but that was a stimulus, and he was going to respond to that. They responded by never coming back to church again. Okay, <laughs> so I just pray that God will lead him and guide him to. Uh, but anyways, you you get what I'm saying. Okay, so always when you get that email, it's a stimulus. How can you respond to that? All right. You've got an opportunity to pray for someone. It's stimulus. How will you respond to that? Always your, you can choice. So can you see your near and pathway might, might keep you back because I'm afraid. I'm scared of people or whatever that is. You can see how all of this plays together. And then lastly, f lastly food. So I'm not going to delve too much on that because um, just simply put, there's a direct correlation between what you eat and cognitive functioning. It's been proven over and over again. We've done, we've done some work at schools where, where one of the classes was so out of order. I went in there and I said, what did you have to eat? The first guy, donuts, chocolates. And so they go. So one guy said, look at my lunch packet. Four slices of white bread, two gas cool drinks, and three chocolates. I said, I want to see this thing. After the uh, break, he comes back. He's like a dancing ball. He got a sugar spike, sugar levels drop. Now he can't keep his eyes open in the classroom. Right. Imagine you give that to, to a kinesthetic child as well. You, I mean, you, you won't be able to deal with them. All right. so, so in terms of just dealing with that as well, the, the diet, and apart from all other stuff, is so important. Right. So that's the drivers that impact your brain performance. And, and, and uh, yeah, I'll take out the example a lot, but you'll see that in a glance. Where are you in terms of that? It'll help you to improve. Um, the next part is about your design. And I want to quickly touch on to your design. So any left-handers here? Okay, a one, two left-handers, but you do use your right-hand as well, hey? Uh, any right-handers? Of course, the rest. So who of you, you write with your right hand, but you kick a ball with your left hand? Your foot. Your foot. You kick a ball with your left foot. Okay, what's wrong with you? Okay, so, so we've got right-handed people left-footed. Who's right and the right footed? Okay, interesting. All right. Uh, so, uh, just observing this audience here, I can see some people, they, 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 they're sitting like this, and see some people sitting like this. How is that? How is it that some people prefer to listen with this ear, and some people prefer to listen with this ear? Okay? It's because of dom the dominance, dominance factor. Carla Hannaford wrote all about it, right? So, so I, I want to just prove to you you've got a dominant eye as well. So what does it mean? It means I look at you with both eyes, but 70 to 80% of information are processed by my dominant eye, which in my case is my left eye, but which is yours. Let's have a test quickly. So what I would like you to do is just straighten your arms like this, make a little hole about this size. Now, straight. Now keep both your eyes open now. And through that hole, look at that dot. All right? Keep on looking. Now I want you to close your left eye and open it. And close your right eye and open it. Ooh. Ooh. What's happening? <laughs> okay? Something's happening. So who of you, when you looked at the dot and you closed your left eye, you couldn't see the dot anymore? Where's those people? Okay. And who of you, when you close your right eye, you couldn't see the dot anymore? So if, you, if you're that person, you are right eye dominant. That's the leading eye. The other is obviously the left eye dominant. Okay, so what does it mean? Does it impact the way I process information? For sure. Okay, does it matter which ear dominance I have? For sure it matters. But what does it matter, okay? Because we have to ask the question, so what? Okay, so... So, so uh, now, now let's just go on in terms of this. The same with the brain. You've got a left and a right hemisphere, right? But they have different functionalities. D 
different faculties. Right now, uh, I'm very cautious to say this is the left and this is the right because you're boxing people in. But there is some truth in that, and I'll, I'll, I'll prove that to you a little bit later. So your left hemisphere mainly, that's where your language resides, okay? Logical, detail, facts, um, what's all the words there, structured, task oriented, learn through language, theoretical, systematic. That's predominantly the ref hemisphere function, although whole brain, but predominantly left. I'll give you one example. Uh, I've heard the testimony of a neurophysicist, and she's got all the degrees in the world, and she had a stroke. Where? On the left side. And she explained the stroke to the outside world from a neurophysicist's point of view, and she lost language. She couldn't read at that moment. She only could see and imagine pictures. So she would connect the picture that you see on the card with the picture on the telephone, and the way that way she could make the phone call. Very interesting story, right? But the right hemisphere is more your creative, holistic, emotions, impulses, spontaneous, people-oriented, learn through pictures, think outside the box, practical and multitasking, right? Now, some of you are very much like this. Who are, uh, with the hand, just more or less, okay? Very much so, okay? Who of you are very much like that? We'll just come out for prayer afterwards, okay? <laughs> And who of you feel you're quite a good combination of the two? More or less, okay? And it will be so, but let's continue. But, but with this experiment or, let's say, test, we can plot you more or less where you are. That helps you because it's going to help you in terms of your processing style. The bottom line here is know yourself that you can manage yourself. Okay, so uh, jokingly, just a joke, um, the left hemisphere people, they will park their cars like that. <laughs> the right hemisphere more or less like that. A fruit salad could look something like this. You know. <laughs> right. Just a joke. <laughs> okay. But then there's another part of your brain. It's, it's, it's about electrochemical functioning. Where does the brain prefer, prefer to, 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 uh, to process more electrochemical functioning? But some people, it's more to the front part of the brain, which makes you an expressive learner. Okay, so that means verbally, talkative, language, outspoken, ask questions. Some people are so strongly expressive, they talk the whole time. You know what I'm saying? My brother's mother-in-law, she would, where's the water? Ooh, this is going to be so nice. Mm -hmm, let me quit going. Oh, that was nice. Let me just put it back here quickly. The whole time talking. But guess what? She has to talk. Because when she talks, she processes information. Have you found yourself talking to yourself? You know what I'm saying? Expressive auditory most probably. Okay? Know that about yourself, know that about, about other people. It will help you to manage yourself and other pe people better. Communicate more effectively, right? Some people are very... So who of you are the, are the expressives? You talk more than you think. Ah, well, you just talk more. <laughs> okay, talk, okay? Who of you are more to the receptive type? More absorbing, reserved, you think before you act? More shy, working... Yes? Mike, where's Mike, that's you. You're the quiet, shy guy. With big muscles, eh? <laughs> right. So, so, but those people, they first need to think and absorb. So if I'm in a meeting, let's say Mike is that very reserved, receptive learner. I will have a meeting and say, Mike, I want to know about this, about the numbers yesterday. We'll be with you, with you just now. I continue with the meeting. I give him chance to process. Five minutes later, so Mike, what do you say? Now I had time to think about it, and when he speaks now, He's, it's in form and well thought through. Otherwise, you would have thought afterwards, you know, I should have said this and I should have said that. And I, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. So remember, that's the extreme, but something in between. So these people must learn to zip their lip at some stage. And these people need, need to come to the party sometimes. Because oftentimes they carry a wealth of stuff, but they never arrive at the party. And they die with all these wonderful gifts and talents, and they never um, avail themselves. The next one is your rational versus emotional learners. Some people, the, the, the more the, the, the um, new cortex, rational, cognitive, intellectual, rational, realistic, task, objective facts. So here, this combination, you might get a right hemisphere creative person, but rational, like an Einstein. 
reason go and smile. I've got this weird picture of myself lighting up the rays of the sun, but E is equal to MC squared is born out of that. You know what I'm saying? That type of thing. But your emotional people, they are, and Kasi, I'm so glad you mentioned it earlier. He said, I have to experience it. Okay? That's your experiential learners. They say the proof is in the eating of the pudding. Don't tell me this pudding, I want to taste it. All right. Some people will read and believe. He said, I want to feel and believe. Okay? I was a math teacher. I'm an emotional learner as well. And I needed to understand where am I going to use this in real life one day. Give me the practical implications of that, not theory only. Right. Um, subjective, emotional, people are in to react instinctively. So can you see there's so many different combinations of profiles. It's not left, right only. Rational, emotional, expressive, receptive. And that's not all. Right. You've got your four brain quadrants. And I mean, this work is... I mean, we did it years ago with that, uh, other stuff. I'm going to just run over it. The, the first type of person is your analyst. Detail. They love detail. More detail they have, the more they love it. Academic, factual, correct numbers. Detail upon detail. The other type of person is your task guy. Action. Task. You know, he's talking and action. When we start the project, we must complete it. There's no time to waste. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. Let's go to work. Okay? That's them. Then you've got your strategic people, your dreamers, um, out of the box. They move boundaries. They think big. They, they're your entrepreneurs. They uh, uh, know is not an answer. Let the light shine on me, those type of people, right? Uh, but if dressed in the cloak of humility, they're beautiful. Um, and relationship is your, it's people, right? Emotions, relationship, supportive, sensitive, right? So you've got the four different quadrants but also a combination of them. So who of you would see yourself predominantly in the analyst column? Predominantly. Who would you see predominantly there? Strategic? None. Okay, Kasi, I would say, if you didn't put your hand, all right. So relationships, this one there? Okay, and task orientated? So, so uh, what's the danger about that one, for instance? They're so far ahead, and they will move and run and they leave a lot of bodies behind them. You know what I'm saying? Okay? Because they can see what you cannot see and we've got to move ahead. Right? They're activated. They get people into motion. I'll give you one example. There was a company, engineering company. All of the leadership was there. They couldn't reach certain targets. We told them you need strategic people on board. They brought those two people on board. Within eight months, all of their targets met. There was a willingness, but how do we do that? Okay. Um, one other example, there was a guy. His wife is an emotional counselor. Her husband is a rational analyst. He's a type of person, when someone cries, okay, are you done? Can we go on now? Okay. <laughs> so his wife said she's learned not to tell her husband, I feel it's time for a new vacuum cleaner. She draws it up an Excel spreadsheet with all the na names and the makes, the prices, the kilowatts. Now I can make an informed decision. Right? But guess what? His son was also an emotional counselor. He doesn't make this, 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 the cricket team. He's our cricket players, okay? So his dad wanted want to give him 10 reasons why he didn't make it and 10 more what he must do to make the team. But the son only wanted to hear, my son, are you okay? Okay, you see, so having this information helps you to connect with people that's not like you. Because you get people that are so strong up there, and others that are so strong down there, it's like worlds apart. But yet, we're one team. Right? So how do we learn to appreciate one another within the context of this? But how does this help me if I have to learn to process information? How does the fact that I'm a task person help me to run more effectively? at school uh, or at, uh, at my business. So, now, uh, the next part is, th that's the high grade part of the session. And I hope you understand. Are you still fine? Yeah. Okay, you're still with me and so on. So, this is a very interesting one. And if you can capture what I'm telling you now, it's going to be wonderful. Right. Remember, um, I said some people are left eye, left ear, right hand, whatever. So, what happens in this case? If, where's all the right eye dominant people? Right eye. Now, so your right eye is controlled by which hemisphere by your left. So what happens, your right eye will take on the properties of the left hemisphere because it's controlled by it. 
So your left hemisphere is your detail hemisphere. So your right eye people, you have an eye for detail. Okay? When you read, you love naturally to read from left to right. When you read, you decode the sentence. You break it up word for word. Right? So reading comes fairly easy for you. And visual order is important for you. But how about the left eye? The left eye is controlled by the picture hemisphere. The non-verbal hemisphere. So for them, pictures is important. Movement. They see the bigger picture. When they look at the sentence, they don't see the detail. They see the big picture. In an ideal world, they would have loved to read from right to left. Now what happens with those people? Okay? There's, there's a word, I saw the dog. So the right eye dominant person, they read, I saw the dog. It happens quickly, but they decode, break it up. The left eye look at the sentence as a whole, and remember, ideally, they want to read from there to there. So they would read, and the eye will regress, regress, and what happens? It becomes, I was the dog. <laughs> okay? Now, then some people say, but my child is dyslexic. No, it's just left eye dominant, right? And it's easy to correct that in terms of learning ability, right? Okay. So, um, uh, does that make sense to you? Okay. All right, so let's talk about the ear. So, I, I would love to see someone who's clearly right ear dominant, but I cannot find someone quickly. But if you are right ear dominant, your right ear is connected to your language hemisphere. So when you listen, when someone speaks, you first listen to the words. What is that person saying? The words, the content. Right? My wife is strongly right ear dominant. I'll explain to you later. <laughs> but if you are left ear dominant, it's connected to the creative, non-verbal brain. So when you listen, the left ear dominant person, you first listen to emotions the rhythm, the tone of voice, how people say things. You will hear what people don't say. Are you going to church? Maybe. And you hear no. He said maybe, but you know he means no. Oh, maybe. You mean that was a yes. So we drove from a meeting, me and my colleague. He said this is what the guy said. He's right here dominant. I said, no, it's not what he said. He said, it is, word for word. I said, yes, that's what he said. That's not what he meant. You know what I'm saying? Because it's the ability to read between the lines. Let's just go back to the eye. Someone would walk fast. The right eye say, that guy's walking fast. The left eye would say, that guy looks disturbed. You see what I'm saying? Picking up body language. So do you know that about yourself? Okay, do you know that about other people now? Does it come into play? You'll see just now, right? Does it make sense to you? So to do this, child, you have to talk, and person, you have to talk nice. Don't scream at him, right? They also, just talk nice to me. Don't scream, right? Also, the musical ear. Ben's very sensitive towards noise. If there's a, like, I'm a left ear, so if the clock is tick, 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 I'll take out the battery because it, I cannot concentrate when there's noise, okay? That's the left ear people, right? Um, the hand, I'm not going to stand st st still too long, that's your detail hemisphere, so fine motor activities, written and verbal, and the left hand, gross motor activities, non-verbal communication. And I've got a great cricket example if you need one. <laughs> right. um, then the last part of this, you've got some people, when they process information, some people, they need to see. If I only spoke and spoke and spoke, and spoke, and spoke. They say, no, no, I, m I must see. Ah, now it's better. <laughs> All right. They need to see, to process. They would say, you know what? You phoned them and said, listen, let me tell you. Send the email. When I read it, I understand. When I see it, I understand. Okay? These people, the kinesthetic people, they would say, show me. How do you do that? Now you'll get brilliant people. They are uh, intellectual giants, but they fail academically. It's like a, a, a mechanic, car mechanic. He, he fails all the exams, but he's the best at what he's do, doing. How's that? Because he's 
kind of stick to the uh, inclined. And then you've got your auditory people. They love to hear. They love to hear. When they listen and hear, they take in a lot of information. So here's the scary part. If I talk to you and you walk out here, guess how many opinions we're going to have about the exact same words that I said. Because some of you listen to what I said, others were reading between the lines, you're looking through your filters, through your neuron pathways, your cultural filters, filters your, you know what I'm saying? So people will walk out here and you two different things, three, four different things, all right? Because of the way they're wired, all right? Um, so do you know that about yourself? So whenever I do a profile feedback for a person, I look at his design. If I see that person is very low on auditory, but high on kinesthetic, I say, let's go for a walk. Then I walk with him, and I give him the information. Right? Um, I have a, I've had one school child, and this is literally the only thing I did. He was 50% auditory, 50% kinesthetic, zero visual. Look, seeing wasn't this big thing. So I said, okay, what you should do is when you prepare for your studies, okay, uh, rec read aloud, say the stuff aloud while you walk around in your room or outside. His average shot up from 48% to 72% the next exam, just by doing that. Right. Now, here is a, this is the crucial part of this session, if you can understand this. Let's say you have a person he or she's left hemisphere, right-handed, right-eye dominant, and right-ear dominant. Okay, that's this person's design. Does it make sense to you? right -o? What happens during stress? During stress, there's more electrochemical functioning on that person's dominant side during stress. So the non-dominant side... If I say switch off, I don't mean like in doors close. It's just you lose between 40 and 60 percent functionality, but it switches off. But lucky for this person, even when that is switched off, he has full sensory access for what he sees, he hears, and the communication. Do you see that? If we have school children like this, nine out of ten school children with this profile. They perform academically well because even during stress, all my faculties can get the information. But look at this poor person. Okay, right hemisphere, right handed, right eye, right ear. What happens with this person during stress? The dominant hemisphere, a lot of electrochemical functioning, the non dominant switches off. What happens? He hears, but doesn't listen. Did you hear what I say? Yes. What did I say? Um, when he has to read, he, he can read, but he has to reread. What did I just read? Okay. And when he has to write an exam or give account, the communication is st struck a blank. We've seen this nine out of ten children with this profile battles academically, especially when they're kinesthetic and emotional. Super intelligent, but they fail academics. Guess what? They believe they're stupid. There's a neuron pathway for him I'm stupid, and he goes through life believing he's stupid, but yet he's a giant cognitively. Can you see what I'm saying? So when we help children understand the design, suddenly the lights go up, and we work with his design to, to help him to learn better. And it's not for children only, even adults. When they see this, there's a light going on for them. And then you've got a mixed one. Like this person is uh, left eye dominant, right-handed, right ear, left eye. So during stress, what happens with him? A lot of action there. What I see, I process. What I hear, I battle. Communication battles. So I'll give you one example of what happened. We were at a mine group. And there was a lot of accidents in the mine. And they asked us to help because when there's an accident in the mine, all the trucks stop, uh, they lose money, and so on. And we, from an economically point of view, we helped them to see what the problem is. And we used this as foundational. So we looked at all the factors that determine their brain performance and the, the design. 
So we found, for instance, that they slept a lot of people in one room. And when it's a day and night shift, the people always, so the sleep patterns were crazy, right? The day and night shift, we corrected that. Um, when they drove on the trucks, the, 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 the glaze of the sun on the white sand was causing visual fatigue. We gave them good glasses. The cabins of the, the trucks were very noisy. We make it sound proof, much better. No visual noise. We had the smokers drive the smokers' cabin and non-smokers drive the non-smokers' cabin. Right? And we got them to stop every two hours, get out of the track, do movement exercises, switching on exercises, drink water, because water is a good facilitator, okay? and then go on. So the result of that, we reduced the incidence by more than 80%, and they doubled the amount of volume of ore that they drove on the trucks by implementing that. So it has practical implications in a hardcore business like the mine. Toyota used this, if a person gets on track and it, it doesn't look switched on, they take him off track immediately. They do the test, right? Now, even with children on various levels, I mean, if a child comes to school without a good meal, or something happened at home that disturbed him. It takes him two, two and a half hours to recalibrate, to learn to focus again. Right? So what can I do immediately to address that? So one school, when the children would come into the school, and the classroom, they would have to have physical contact with the teacher, Sun Valley School in, in, in Cape Town. That school is a government school, been, a, been shown as the top 120 schools in the world, and top 10 schools in Africa. So as they walk in the classroom, they have to show five, four, three, two, or one. Five means everything is good. Four, good. Three, mm, two, problem. One serious problem. So what happens, the first 15, 20 minutes of the day, the teachers call out the one, one and twos in the room. While the rest of the class are reading, either a parent is coming in or they, and he just recalibrates that child. Right? And that child is set for the rest of the day. Right. It's just using the brain technology and, and, and exercises. So I've got a list of wonderful exercises that you can take home with you and uh, implement immediately. All right. So the last part of this is um, the question today is not to ask am I smart or am I dumb. The question to ask is how am I dumb. Ach, I mean how am I smart. Okay. <laughs> right. And this is how it's intelligence preferences. Okay. So I'm not going to go into detail but there are different your logical, mathematical, um, linguistic, spatial, visual, physical, kinesthetic, sensory, intrapersonal, spiritual, musical, nature, creative, and inter uh, interpersonal. Right. So when we work on an emotional intelligence level, we look strongly at interpersonal or an intrapersonal. Because if you are interpersonal, self-strong, but interpersonal, not good, you might become a bully. Because my way is the highway. Okay, if you are interpersonal good, but not intrapersonal, they'll lead you around on your nose the whole way. You'll be well known, likable, but you just fall for everything. Okay, so we need, so the question is, can you develop that? Of course you can. So it, it's about behavior change. Can you change behavior, right? Of course you can, but it doesn't have to happen overnight. I often tell people, you know, I once my nail was, I eat my nail, and it was blue. And it, it took time to grow out, and it was sore and painful. And something, I just clicked something. I realized, you know, I can pray for that nail. I can rebuke that nail. It's going to take six months to grow out. And such is life often the design, okay? So I always tell people, be patient, but be deliberate. It's not going to happen spontaneously. You have to set the wheels in motion. So just move uh, in terms of that. So... C can you see, we, we always had the three, um, mathematical, math uh, spatial, visual, or language. That was the three, IQ. But there's so much more that makes up a person. All right. Do you know that about yourself, about the people that you work with? All right. So I explained to you, we use this at Anglo-American, the world's first largest uh, open cast iron ore mine. Um, th th those truck drivers, so that huge trucks. I mean, one of those tires cost you 500,000 rand. How many dollars is that? 50,000? dollars, one tire, so can you imagine one accident, they're not going to like you. Um, so there's a guy getting off the track, doing switching on exercises, drinking his water, um, and uh, he gets going, right? <laughs> so that's where it happened. Um, the university here at Stellenbosch, they use it because when students study, 
uh, and they fail. The, the universities don't get funding. So we've had a wonderful case studies of students. One student I just called, told us before, she was a physiotherapist uh, student. She failed twice in a row. And then when you fail twice, you've got to go. They, the, the student support um, council made a case for said, listen, let us put her through this. We look at the neurological design and, 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 and design a strategy according to her information processing style. She went through flying colors. Uh, they tell me every single day the students come and say we want to do this profile, we want to do this profile, okay, because they know it just uh, aids them. And then corporate. So, um, you know, uh, whenever we start a, a, a development process with corporates, we start with the basic. How does your neurological design look like? Okay, and how are you wired? And um, Cassia, I spoke about a million miles per, per, per hour, but that's my story for the yeah, session. Great.